Hello and welcome to another episode of The Living Philosophy. Today we're going to talk about The Dispossessed, which is a, a novel from the 70s by the sci-fi fantasy author Ursula K. Le Guin. And a really, really interesting novel that I'm just after reading. And I'm a massive fan of, of sci-fi and... I love that sci-fi allows you to sandbox ideas, allows you to test out ideas creatively and to see where they lead. And what Le Guin does with this book is she... It's this star system that's out there. I believe it's Alpha Centauri. They're called the Cetians, or the, the, the Terrans call them the Cetians. And it's a... Uh, They've got a, the main planet like Earth and they've got a moon, except in their case, the moon is actually a habitable planet. Relatively habitable. It's very sparse, but it has got trees. It's, it's got its own indigenous trees and its own indigenous fish and it's got waters and stuff. So it is like, it's on the, the, the fringes of, of habitability. So humans are able to live there. And at this point, there is a group of humans who have descended from this group called the Odonians following the teachings of a great teacher called Odo. And they have set up this idyllic kind of anarchist, anarcho-syndicalist community on the moon. And they've been living there for 150 years. And they're more or less disconnected from the main planet. We don't have a lord. What? I told you. We're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. First, be quiet. So the moon is called Anares in this story. And the planet is called Eurus. And Eurus is kind of like this, uh, I guess, 18th century Europe in a way. It's it's kind of like 18th century Europe extrapolated on. It reminds you of the of the central civilization in the Hunger Games, in the in the inner kingdoms of, of the Hunger Games, where it's just opulence and there's such inequality between the, the rich and the poor. And the rich are just like pure decadent. They've got every luxury you can possibly imagine whilst the poor are living in complete privation on the edges of that society. And so you've got this planet that is heavily conflicted. You've got uh, three different civilizations. So one of them is this uh, unequal kind of society, which is kind of like a capitalist society. There's another society which is kind of uh, kind of like China, I guess. It's, it's capitalist. It's, it's kind of a communist capitalist mix, kind of authoritarian regime. And then you've got this other region and on the other hemisphere of the planet which is really Ben Billy which is very just poor they're, they're impoverished and it's kind of the place where the other two kingdoms have their proxy warfares and the thing that I loved about this book is that Le Guin isn't a she isn't just waxing idealistic she isn't saying that anarchism is the way forward it's like she's she's genuinely created an attempt to map out what would happen and what we see is that the the idealists who move to Anaris who move to that moon and create that anarcho-syndicalist society they become over time there's a tyranny of opinion there's a tyranny of the majority and you realize that yes there's a revolution in the sense of we've broken away from that that class system and that opulence of wealth and and we've embraced our, our ideals but on the other hand the we've gotten rid of laws believing that people can govern themselves but in place of those laws you've got the tyranny of public opinion you've got the the tyranny of almost the political correctness in, in some sense it's kind of be the same level so we're talking about a, a level green civil Civilization from spiral dynamics. What's interesting with Anaris is that I see it decay. You see it. You see it go from the level green, that kind of spiral dynamics level green, where you're looking at a, a visionary society. You're saying, "Can't we all get along? Can't we all work together? Can't we all be equal?" And those are kind of the, the foundations of a of a green created society. And that's the ideal of communism and anarchism: is people having this positive view of human nature where we can all just live in harmony with each other. But you see, and I'm not sure if it's because of the the landscape of Anaris or whether it's just the, the nature of what would happen but the civilization goes from being this idealistic thing and it kind of decays to like a, a blue level into a more of a, a disciplined gritty getting down with the, the details of life and just kind of like chugging on and so it's, it's kind of a reflection of a tough life and so it decreases in complexity as as is only natural and this got me thinking about what's happening with communism what's, what's, what would happen if you achieved a communist society if you achieved an anarchist society. And I'm trying to think of a, a pithy way to formulate this and I guess it's that communes are created by ideals and destroyed by FOMO. What I mean by that is that Anaris works because it's on it's on this moon, right? It's completely disconnected. But if you were to form a commune in the midst of this globalized civilization with all its luxuries, with all its opulence, and you were 
you, you'd create that because you know the complexity, you know the anxiety, you know the tension that comes with living in this in this globalized society. Yes, there's all these luxuries, but there's the heightened anxiety and claustrophobia of civilization as well. And what would happen is that, yes, so we want to get away, we want to get back to nature, that's why we create it, but what happens to destroy that is that the second generation, they don't grow up knowing the complexities of civilization. They, they haven't grown up with that distaste for it. They haven't gotten sick of it. And so they're going to look at the life around them, a simple life, this is all right, and then they're going to look at what peop- what's going on over the fence, what's going on with the people who are living in the greater civilization. They're going to be like, wow, that's that's really interesting. I want, a, I want a piece of that. I want a, what's like all these technologies all these intricacies of civilization that that would become really appealing and so I think the the thing about anarchism and communism is that it's it's not really a way out because as long as it's as long as it's just this idea of of abandoning progress and abandoning the what technology has built and all the enlightenment ideals what is created in this globalized society by creating a commune you don't turn your back just on those things and live happily ever after what's going to happen is that you say no to it and you can live life content because you're comparing your life now and the inner peace you feel compared with the life you experienced before but the next generation don't get to do that and so the descending into into that state of Id- idyllic anarchism is actually inevitable now because of the way humans have gone that it will just rise back up. Complexity is something that we're going to do as time goes on. Humans are now clearly y- you can you can hinder us, but we will inevitably move towards greater and greater complexity as long as the land is fertile enough. Once once there's enough fertile land and there's crops and animals around to domesticate, then you see the humans as as naturally happened. In in a number of places around the world they will domesticate those those plants and those animals that they have around them and they will the size of their civilization will grow in complexity and so it's it kind of the idea of going to anarchism and and the communism once the state has withered away is that it's it's appealing on paper but really it's it's unnaturally idealistic because within a couple of generations it will all those ideals will have worn off because people will be born into a simpler state of mind and then the complexity will build up again. It's the the contrast with the current life. And that's why I think that the solution moving forward isn't to create an anarchist society, society isn't to create a communist society where we eschew all these benefits of, of civilization, but also all the negative aspects. I think it's we've somehow got to integrate it. We've got to make this com- complex human society more utopian rather than going seeking utopia in the, in, in the, as, as Rousseau saw it, in the noble savage. I, I don't think, uh, this, this return to, to nature is going to help us because you're just dooming your descendants to have to go through this complexity and you're giving them the Gordian knot of trying to figure out the complexity of civilization. So I think we have to find a way to make complexity livable, to make this into a utopian world. And I loved reading, uh, Le Guin because it really drill that home for me. You're, you're looking at this civilization and an ours, and there's a lot of idealism, but you also see that it doesn't work. The bureaucracy is starting to creep in after 150 years. The power games are starting to be played because inevitably things need to be organized a little bit. And so a bureaucracy begins to form. People begin to have more power than other people. And so you can see the, the nascent beginnings already after 150 years beginning to creep into this idealistic civilization. Uh, whereas on the other hand, you look at Eurus and you've got such an unequal society. And it's not like our modern inequalities. It's more like 18th century inequality, 19th century inequality. The thing that spurred Marx to write the Communist Manifesto, it's the, the massive inequality between rich and poor, where the rich are suppressing the poor. And what's happened in the 19th and 20th centuries is that we've, the, the middle class has expanded so much and the working class, the, the wealth of everyone who's part of civilization has, has risen. The living conditions have risen. And so there's much less reason for for uh, civil for revolution and so even though things aren't ideal even though the rich are still so much richer than the poor it's our living conditions are, are so high comparatively to to history and to other civilizations that there's there isn't that that fermenting uh, revolutionary energy there in terms of uh, a class divide so it's interesting to see that in in Eurus there there is that and you can see how why Marx was the one to, to come out why Marx at that time came out with with 
with communism, why socialism was so much in the air from 1848 onwards. And it's that dream, it's that dream of overthrowing the bourgeoisie, of shoving it in her face, of re-educating them, and of building up uh, an ideal civilization from us, the, the disgruntled workers from us, the, the trodden down workers. But now that doesn't really work because we're not the trodden down, we're kind of caught between, we're, we are both the the master and the slave that that dichotomy exists within us and so i think uh Le Guin kind of she she takes almost the, the caricatures of the different spiral dynamics levels and differentiates them and we see them in different civilizations around their those two worlds so i really enjoyed the book it was a beautiful book and she's such a such a brilliant writer she's got such a imagination and there's uh, that taoist strain that runs through her work and uh really yeah i love it it's a really uh brilliant story like really engaging and a page turner but also just the ideas and this is what i love about sci-fi i read asimov's foundation series last year and i'm hooked on the expanse and on the mandalorian and on star trek discovery and i just love that sci-fi gets to it's almost like that blank canvas it it allows the the collective unconscious or whatever is within us to paint uh, any possibilities because it's it's like i guess back in the day imagining to sir thomas more the first utopia book uh, called utopia and utopia by the way is comes from no place so topia being place and eu being nowhere um so no place non-place so utopia is is nowhere which is a a beautiful etymology considering how we use it but in that original utopia that sir thomas more wrote which would be back around 15th 16th century it's uh, off the coast of the new world and that's where his utopian civilization lives and so it's that thing of when there were still places left to discover on earth we could it 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 had that blank canvas whereas now sci-fi the the blank canvas is out in space it's on other worlds and so it's sci-fi allows us to sandbox ideas that are already on earth by seeing how things could have played out differently it's like simulations and it's brilliant mind stimulating stuff in that sense and Le Guin is just it was it was a it was fantastic author and very inspiring I'd highly recommend the book if if you are interested uh, I'll, I'll put a link down in the description and yeah so today I just thought I would uh, give an experimental kind of book review a new a new genre of uh, of, of, of episode on the channel so hope you've enjoyed it if you have um, please let me know down in the comments and please subscribe if you haven't already and I'd love to hear from you and uh, please remember to give us a thumbs up down below and yeah I shall see you next time guys thank you for watching